Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me here, especially Professor Manuela Canillo de Cuna. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to meet with people that I don't usually meet with as often. Sorry, let me. Okay. Also, I'd, I'd like to say that what I want to discuss about here today is work that's been going on over the last 16 years with national partners. Uh, and what I mean by national partners are national and local researchers and educators, but also uh, non-government organizations, NGOs, community-based organizations, um, and also farmers groups, and covering about 20 different countries from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Nepal, China, to East Africa, Burkina Faso, uh, West Africa, excuse me, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Ethiopia, Uganda, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, let me think, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, Peru, Mexico, uh, Mexico meaning Yucatan, Mexico, not all of Mexico, and uh, Ecuador, and Cuba. Okay. So just to say that this has been a collaborative work that's been going on a long time with these different partners, and I hope I can represent the work we've done together. So I think there was one other thing I wanted to say just before going into my talk is that I agree with the earlier speakers that we're not talking about preservation, uh, at least I'm not, or we're looking at the idea that there are systems that allow for evolution and adaptation. So it doesn't matter if one variety disappears and another one doesn't, so long as there's enough diversity there. And diversity for whom? For communities to be able to use it, access it, and make it better, and benefit from it. So I guess the view that I'm looking at here is how can we move to this supporting farmers and supporting local institutions so that farmers have the diversity they need when they need it to adapt to change? And I think change is key here. I think earlier speakers had talked about that things are changing. There are major climatic changes, changes in pests and diseases, soil degradation. So I think when we're talking about, I don't even like to use the word on-farm conservation because I think we're looking at use of diversity for farmer communities, is I think we're concentrating on functional diversity. The diversity that people can use to improve productivity and reduce vulnerability when change is the norm. Vulnerability, I mean the, that we want to reduce the probability of production losses in the future. So productivity now without loss in the future. And I think there are several prerequisites to be able to do this. One is that there needs to be this type of diversity in the farmer's production system, whether it's there indigenously or it's brought in or it's deployed. And it has variation in the traits that the communities need, such as agronomic, adaptive, and quality. And not only does the diversity need to be there or at least available, it has to actually reduce the risk of production losses. And that's something, I'm a biologist. I started out as an anthropologist, but then I came, became a, a plant ecologist in later years. <laughs> but um, because I think it's really important to know also about the plant and how people manage it. So in addition that diversity is reducing risk, the systems need to be able to evolve. The material needs to be available, and we've talked a lot already about different types of seed systems. Christophe talked about uh, the ones that are more local and informal and those that are more formal. But these are systems that the material that farmers have or are given or give can also adapt to change. And I think the most key of all is that you have the institutions, information, and policy support in place for farmers to benefit from the value of their materials. So, okay, it looks better. So I think, sorry, I can't see this. I'm too short, sorry. Okay, so um, what we have here is, I think, I, what we talked about this morning, a lot about nomenclature and kinships and levels of relationships. Well, it's a, very much a similar thing in terms of how farmers characterize the varieties that they have. Different varieties might be given the same name, same varieties with different names. However, what is very consistent across farmers is the descriptions they use to describe their varieties. They might call it something different, but they can be very consistent over large um, areas and countries on what type of traits they use to describe. 
And also, as you know, it's very important for farmers to bring the material with them when they're describing the material, so it's in front of them. And so they agree as a group on what these different varieties are and how they name them. But then there's a second step of taking these little cards, the little blue cards, from the farmers and organize them in a way that they can be looked at in terms of how different, different diversity is. On the one hand, farmers have a chance to exchange, to talk with materials, and for researchers to understand how farmers look and understand their varieties. On the other hand, it's a way also to organize how different the diversity is. And differences are important if you want to be able to evolve and adapt. So this is just from some earlier work that we did with the different countries around the world, but it's just a slide to show you that although interventions are very site-specific, studying a system, no matter what culture or what crop, can have some global methods to do so. And in this way, we were able to look with our national partners to look at how much diversity is really still on farm. The black little letters are the average diversity at the household level in these communities, and the red are the amount of varieties of, of the different crops at the community level. So as you can see, there's, there's lots of diversity. And one other area that we looked at is not only the number of varieties farmers have, but how it's distributed, how even it is. If you look at farm A and farm B, if you think of these of two farmers, each having nine different varieties of, let's say, maize, you see that farm A, they're planting all the varieties to the same level, whereas farm B has two dominant varieties. This makes a difference in how available diversity is or how long it's going to stay there or how long it's going to evolve. So in all the work that we're doing, we're not just looking at how many varieties there are in terms of diversity, but how much over what area and how is it distributed. Um, this is just to show some other work that a lot of diversity does exist. These, uh, the yellow are traditional uh, crop varieties uh, are um, modern, introduced, come from outside of Central Asia, modern are bred from Central Asia local material. So you can see that a lot of diversity of major fruit crops where fruit trees were domesticated still exist in farmers' fields. And what can be done? Uh, what was done here through this work was establishing nurseries that are producing saplings annually of traditional varieties because here the problem was availability. Farmers couldn't access different types of materials even if they needed it. So what the idea was, how can we increase it for them? I'm probably talking too fast for the translators. So I okay. I think one uh, key area that we want to look at is kind of, there are several different accesses if we're looking at the use of diversity for farmers' livelihoods. One is that, of course, people want to have more productivity and to evolve be it economic, social, cultural gains in their communities. Another is, so at, at present, another is uh, vulnerability. What we want to do is also reduce the probability that there's crop loss in the future. And the access that I've been working with with the different national partners and farmers around the world is diversity, is the intraspecific diversity of crops. And so you might have some site where you have very high productivity, that there's maybe growing just one variety with lots of inputs, perhaps, fertilizer. Uh, but you don't know, as you know, with cropping systems that uh, over time things can become uh, less resistant to diseases or change over time, that in the future, or if it happens to be a different climate the next year, they might lose everything. Whereas another site where you want to see, can we both keep productivity high, but also ensure that the next year and the year after, there is resilience in the system. And this is where diversity, the interspecific diversity of crops can help play an answer. So how, so we've been talking about functional diversity. How do we identify also functional diversity in agricultural um, ecosystems? Uh, the same way we are, what we're doing is asking farmers, of course, how do they view pests and diseases? I think as anthropologists, you do this a lot also. But what, what we did is also looking at communities together and having them agree or, or look at how they describe their diseases and how they describe resistance uh, and what, are, um, what, what they feel which varieties would be more resistant to different diseases. And then we take that one step further. We've looked at how much diversity farmers are growing in their fields, and we've discussed with them and then gone through their fields. Then we also walk through their fields to look at the damage during the disease periods of the field to look and see how much damage in different fields uh, to a particular disease. 
And here we're talking about diseases and pests where there is variation within the crop of resistance to that pest or disease. So it has to be that, in fact, the functional diversity. It has to be a crop uh, host pathogen or host pest system where there's diversity within the crop so it could reduce diseases. And what we found, which I think, too fast, you're down. I'm sorry, because they're translating. Okay. Well, at least I, what we found then, this is an example for maize, and I will show you a few other examples. But um, maybe I'll, I'll really slow down by pointing. Okay. So these are households with just uh, one variety of a crop. Uh, and this is maize, and it's looking at northern leaf blight. And these are households with two varieties, three varieties, and four varieties. And this is the level of damage. And we can see as a household has more diversity, more varieties, there is less damage in their field that year to northern leaf blight. But what is very interesting is what we see is a reduction in variant. Not just, so you see this line is higher and this is shorter here. Okay. So what, what this is that, okay, let's say that I'm this farmer and I got a really good variety this year. Next year, if there's a change, I might not be doing so well. Whereas if I have three or four varieties, not only do I have less damage now, I have less probability of damage in the future. And I want to show you um, some other data, which is that we've worked with beans in Uganda that's just come out showing this very same thing, but very dependent on when there's times of high disease. So someone was talking about you know wet year, dry year. When there was high anthracose, this is beans, common beans, this is angular leaf spot, this is anthracose, another disease. When there was, this year, there was a high anthracose incident. At that point, diversity was significant in reducing the damage and also less variability, okay? Whereas in angular leaf spot, when there wasn't as much disease, it didn't reduce. So what this is showing is when there's high disease in the system, diversity is playing a significant role. And not just number of varieties, I'm sorry of all these little pictures here, but just to show you, these are plantains and bananas, and this is in Ecuador. And Ecuador is told to have one of the highest export of bananas, but these are the Cavendish bananas where they have high amounts of pesticides. Also in Ecuador, which I think people working in the Amazon and in the coastal area know, plantain is one of the staple foods. There is a high diversity of plantain, and one of the methods farmers use is not the number of varieties, but the evenness how they have several varieties dominant and, and other small. So as you get more and more areas planted, this, okay, more and more varieties planted to the same area, you have less disease. So it's not just, as I was saying, number of varieties, but also spatial distribution that's controlling uh, pest and disease damage. This is for angular leaf spot, okay. And this is all based on First, going with the farmers, understanding how they view disease, measuring the disease with them, understanding with them how many varieties they have, and walking with them, farmers love GPS, walking around and seeing the areas of each of their varieties. And the sample size is 60 households per village that we looked at. Okay. So that was to look at some of the use of diversity in terms of, of managing pests and diseases. Some of the other work that I think is really interesting in this functional use of diversity in supporting farmers, this is from, from Yucatan. And you can see that the soils here are not very soil. They're pretty much rock. Uh, and also, for those that know about the Yucatan, there is a dry period in the middle of the wet period. And therefore, what has been developed here, there are two different, well, there are many different types of maize, local maize, but natal, which is the smallest one, it goes from maturity to, uh, from planting to maturity in seven weeks so it can avoid the drought, which is very fast. You plant it, seven weeks later, you've got a little maize that you can eat. Whereas uh, shuknal, which is a much longer one, it's, it's a drought resistant. So one is avoiding drought, and one is standing longer on the field, and it's avoiding the drought, so it's able to be harvested later on the field. So it's this use of functional diversity for farmers to meet their livelihood needs. Again, some other work um, from my, with my colleagues in Burkina Faso is the amount of diversity based on unpredictability. Now, with climate change, climates are increasing or decreasing, depending on where you are in the globe. But also, there's an increase in unpredictability. And what we found now is that where there's more unpredictability of rainfall, there were higher numbers of sorghum varieties for the farmers to deal with that because they don't have the inputs of water, of other fertilizer, and 
things, so they use diversity as their means to survive. The same thing with apple trees in, in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan is that they, they have to have at least a few different varieties for, for, well, for many reasons, but one is to avoid frost, because if there's a frost, all your flowers die and all your apples die. So you do need that. And then it's, it's these, and even within late maturing, early maturing, and middle maturing, there is diversity within the timing for frost. So, and if we go back to fruit trees, and this is something that we've just started to look at now, is farmers have been telling us that, uh, for those of you who know about fruit trees, fruit trees are clonal, therefore, and they're outcrossing, which means they have to mate with another tree. Okay, so which means that, you cannot have the same variety. If you have all the same variety, you won't have any cross-pollination. So you have to have at least some other varieties for pollination. And so what farmers have been telling us and what we'd like to look at both it, with mango and in apple uh, production is that by increasing diversity, you're increasing the levels of pollination and thus there's more productivity of the crop. And these are things I think that people don't think about when they're thinking about the functional diversity or having diversity in the field. Actually, diversity is providing more productivity and more resilience in these cases, not in all cases. And that's the challenge, I think, with local communities is to decide where it is causing an increase in productivity without reducing loss in the, without increasing loss in the future. Um, we have, uh, this is just some of the work to show that working in, um, in Central Asia, also with farming communities to understand not only how they identify different varieties of culti cultivated varieties, but also wild. Do they, how, what is the level of nomenclature that farmers have with their wild varieties to the level of forms that have different tastes? And what do they do with this wild material? And what is, in terms of the conservation impact, what is the impact of their collection of wild, um, we have wild almond, wild apple, wild pistachio, wild and walnut for the forest. How much do they collect from? How, uh, what, is, what is the impact? And this is, we're looking at, and what's used for, and what I think is really interesting is a lot of it is used for um, grafting, that still they are bringing in diversity into the system by bringing in wild, not only wild root material, which is very common here, and, and cultivating cultivated uh, plants on it, but bringing in wild material and grafting it onto cultivated mother plants. All of these ways of introducing the varieties they have to adapt to the different needs in their systems. The same goes for some work of my colleagues in, this is in East Africa, in, in, in Kenya, and looking at the domestication, redomestication, that they're, the way farmers bring new diversity into the system when they're close by where the wild relatives are. I just wanted to say a few things about production spaces um, and how farmers manage different production spaces. This is the number, a log number of the different varieties and this is the number of trees grown at household level. And you can see the purple is the orchard and the blue is the home garden. So in an orchard, which is a large area, as farmers have more and more trees, they tend to plant very few varieties. Whereas in a home garden, as farmers have more and more trees, they tend to plant different varieties, kind of using it more as a small area or, or where they decide which varieties later on they're going to put into their fields as experimental. Because as you know, with fruit trees, once you decide to put the tree in, it's there for a while, so you need to look, watch it. I have a few more slides just to look more like on some of the work on seed systems and some of the differences on seed systems. And I think this is very similar to what Christophe showed of different people giving different seeds and a very connected system throughout. But this is a system in Pucallpa in Peru where there's almost no, I um, probably can't read this. The, the green is within the village. Um, and the, the blue is, it's really hard, I can, is across villages. But you can see that most of the exchange is within villages of the different materials because, of course, it takes three days to get from one village to the next for the farthest away. So in terms of strategies for supporting seed systems, as we said, they'll be very different depending on the situation. But in terms of studying and understanding seed receivers, seed givers, percent seeds, these type of methods can be very standardized, so you can compare different seed systems. And then I, uh, I think I have to disagree with uh, our colleague from Peru about one model for managing. I think that we, we <laughs> I get to do that, I'm standing here. 
I think that there are, it, we need different models and that there will never be one specific model for managing everything. There may be a, a, a systematic way for analyzing systems globally, but in terms of our interventions, I think we need a large portfolio that there will be different things to do in, in different terms. Um, one other, one reason for saying that, of course, is what we found here, this is how we relate seed sources to diversity on farm. This is again the fruit trees from Central Asia. Um, here we have um, the number of varieties and here we have the number of sources. A source might be a neighbor uh, or type of source, an extension, an NGO, um, uh, it could be from a market. So those farmers with more sources are also having more diversity and therefore it's not just a question, I think, of a resilient system of farmers having enough diversity. It's having enough sources where they can get diversity to get from. In case one source disappears, then there are other sources where they can get materials they need from. I, I, this is because um, we're working closely with economists also and looking a bit is can we, because when you talk to politicians, of course, they want to have a dollar sign on what all this means and if farmers are really benefiting and what is the actual amount. And so what we've been looking at is taking what we look at for the disease work, a damage abatement model, and seeing if we can look at the value of using interspecific diversity to reduce damage versus other methods. So this brings in our economists and social scientists to compare other management methods or using pesticides or even uh, IPM integrated management to see what is the actual value that the intraspecific diversity is adding into the system. And I think some of you also have worked with what we've been looking at, this is also in China and Morocco, is what would farmers be willing to pay if they lost their diversity? What does it mean to them in, in dollar things? I think the last group of things I want to talk about is, is the real importance of the local institutions and community institutions that have the capacity to use diversity. This is um, a biodiversity registry in Nepal with the grandfather Narayana Subidi and his granddaughter. He can't read, she can, but he keeps track of what varieties are in the village and what are their traits. So farmers have access and knowledge to what other people have in the village and who has it for their own exchange. And in Nepal, the Nepalese government is now supporting this throughout Nepal to help support small communities to keep track of the materials that they have. So they put uh, about $20,000, which is a lot for Nepal, into supporting these in different regions of high diversity. We also need to remember that a lot of times Intraspecific diversity is one of the one of the few resources that farmers might have and access to if they they might not want or they can't afford other chemical inputs or or irrigation. So what what we've been looking at also is developing these community seed banks, which I think a lot of people are doing. In terms of it's a way of getting different. In the beginning, in 2003, there were 11 different local varieties, which have been increased to 28 different varieties. But what's interesting, it's really the poor people that have increased in terms of who's accessing this material. It's like a rotating fund. You borrow the seeds and you give back more when you, when you come back. This is a seed bank. I want to show this one first and then I'll go back. This is a seed bank and a gene bank. And this was an initiative by the Burkina Bay on that they wanted not only to have a seed bank, this is a women's group where they could have seeds and multiply them and, and, and have them available for farmers. But also they went down five meters under the ground and dug kind of a place where if there's war, if there's some kind of um, army coming through, they can lock this off and hide the seeds so they have them available in their community. And there are three of these that we've helped support throughout Burkina Faso that are completely run by these communities. So there's a difference for those who are not in plant genetic resources of a seed bank where you're multiplying seeds that are available for land races and an actual gene bank where things are conserved for future use and future breeding. Another uh, really interesting work that's been going on in West Africa and expanding is these diversity field flora. It's collective action where it's groups of men and women are organized to, for themselves to be able to better access assess the diversity they have, 
how they can help to improve qu uh, use quality seeds. And also through weekly meetings, they, they gain knowledge of international conventions, uh, legislation relevant to plant genetic resources. And people said to me, why would farmers want to know that? Well, they, they absolutely do. They're very interested and it's also a chance of them to social network with other, with other farmers groups. And this has been really successful in terms of farmers leading. When we talk about participatory plant breeding and about research, farmers are the ones asking the breeders what thing they want and what research questions they want done, rather than supplying a product or saying, do you want this or not? OK. Uh, now, this is something else that I think, OK, uh, who said to me? He said, oh, I, I use a computer. I'm also a farmer. Well, I think that farmers in developing worlds are maybe not using computers, but they're definitely using cell phones, and they're definitely using text messages. And this is definitely changing their access to information. And I think some work that Imi is working on is taking weather information or disease information, getting it into text messages, um, and uh, uh, having, getting it to farmers' cell phones so they can make better decisions and they can uh, enhance the negotiation of farmers themselves to negotiate with those people buying their material. Because they have information in the market, they can hold it one day longer rather than being taken advantage of. Um, so this is, I just have a, this, this is, I know it looks complicated, but what I want to point out is this area. I think that we've been doing a lot of work with community seed banks, community biodiversity registries, community-based things, but we haven't moved up to the level that seed multipliers and suppliers are both uh, are using and supplying traditional materials that can adapt to change together with farmers, and that there's information flow. And this is um, a project that, in fact, we've even been given funded now to look at in several different countries to see. What are the criteria for those seed companies that, as you might say, are morally correct, are ethical, that would give the benefits back with the farmers, or what would work collaboratively with farmers that could take the access to genetic resources uh, to a level higher than community seed banks and community, community measures? And, in, and finally, with my policy colleagues, what are the policy instruments that are needed there that can support that seed multiplication and seed supply is at a level where farmers are getting the demands they have and not the demands set by these large uh, multinational country, uh, companies. Um, I think I'm not, this I was just saying about, uh, I just wanted to mention some of the, the different types of breeding goals set by farmers because people were discussing breeding, but more, I think the real key thing is here is when you're doing breeding, participatory breeding with farmers, it's different than having one environment where everything will work. You're not providing a package of fertilizer and pesticide. You're making sure that the variety can grow on very different environments. And therefore, when it comes to the point that it's released and registered, this is Nepal's first farmer bred variety, it's six bulk lines. It's not a single deuce line that uh, has to be uniform, uh, stable, and distinguished. It's six lines that are bulked and can be marketed and released as that, which would be difficult in French law right now. But, <laughs> but in Nepal, they have changed the, the seed release system for this. So there are other ways to get around some of these really strict laws. There's a work being done also in West Africa of certifying seed sellers rather than seeds or uh, geographical identification of products that have three or four varieties within them. So there are different creative ways ongoing of how these varieties can, the benefits and value of these varieties can go back to the farmers. Um, such as uh, this is also with the date palm of, of, uh, of even getting a new law passed in terms of the uh, subsidies for conserving the whole date palm system, incentives, not subsidies. So, I think this is my last slide, and I had some acknowledgments, and I was sitting here, this is in Syria, and I'm thinking, here's this farmer thinking over his field, contemplating life, thinking about nature, and I went down the hill, and he was on his cell phone talking about nature to his friend or something. So I, it was just kind of to show that there is a change in what, what the farmer is, and I, I think this is one of my, my favorite quotes is that if we look at the potato and the uh, blight, the great potato blight in, in Ireland, I think that this is, we need to keep in mind that the real lesson of the famine is not a sterile one of bitterness and hatred, but a warning that is never outdated. 
that the greed and short-sighted self-interest of groups with effective power, no matter with what veneer of respectability they may be disguised by current economic or political thought, must not be permitted to ride roughshaw over the long-term welfare of the people as a whole. And I think that's, we have to keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. <laughs>